education you ever you never have to leave the city um and two cunies this is great so and and rights work has been presented at venues including rush arts wave hill which is right around the corner uh smack melon el museo del barrio the bronx museum uh, all here in new york city the kennedy center and the museum of america is in washington dc the emerson gallery in berlin germany and he's executed numerous public commissions including a permanent installation for the 225th street subway station uh along for the two and the five trains for the mta arts and design program uh, as well as installations for the smithsonian and nasa in all in dc and right has been awarded a fellowship in socially engaged art from a blade of grass foundation and he's an uh, ape x art international fellow he was born in guayaquil ecuador and he lives and works right here in the Bronx. So we're very happy to speak to him. Nikki, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. I feel like uh, it's a, a big honor and a privilege to speak to Lehman College students and, and teachers. Um, I definitely have a good memory of my one year at Lehman College studying art and philosophy because I'm all about the money. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the only reason I left was because I got accepted to Cooper Union's free college. Uh, and and I, I restarted college with a freshman year at Cooper uh, because I didn't want to miss their foundational thing, you know. Are they but, still uh, free, though? I feel I think. No, they're, they're, now they have like a they have a big scholarship program and they and pretty much okay. everyone on a subsidy, but it's not exactly free. And they're trying to get back to free. They had a they had. Gotcha. Some kind of OK, yeah. it's an excellent school regardless. But yeah, yeah. continue. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a school for art, science and architecture. So mm -hmm. um, especially engineering, actually, I should say art, engineering and uh, architecture. So if anyone's interested in in those things, you should definitely check out Cooper Union. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I would like to start by reading a little something about this since we're in a since this is like a design thing. Um, this is an interesting book, a little tiny book called All Art is Mythological mm. by Timothy Morton. Ecological, right? I'm sorry, what did I say? Uh, mythological, although that's also true. <laughs> that's also true, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> All Art is Ecological by Timothy Morton, who's a philosopher, actually. And um, he, his, this tiny, tiny volume is, uh, it packs a huge philosophical punch, even though it's tiny. And, um, and it's just kind of all over the place, but there are a lot of things that are relevant to um, artists and designers. And here's, a, here's a, just a quote from page 77. The art versus craft or art versus design distinction breaks down while leaving the difference between what a thing is for, what a thing is for, and its openness, its futurality intact. Beautiful is often said to be the opposite of useful. It's held to be an unnecessary inconvenience, which is why so much of the modern world is so ugly. But beauty and usefulness and uselessness can't be separated at all. So every decision is a political one, allowing allowing a watch to be a landing strip for a fly, allowing a plastic bag to be a bird murderer, allowing a painting to be seen by people who can afford, only by people who can afford the entrance fee. Living in a design, in a building designed to shunt dirty air somewhere else, where, we, where now we realize that somewhere else just means nowhere else because it's on the same planet. And irritatingly or wonderfully, this in-betweenness means you can never have the perfect design because interconnectedness doesn't mean that there's an obvious whole that obviously transcends its parts and is bigger and better and better than the parts. And the parts are just components in the machine of the whole. A political system is also a design thing. So this definitely affects what kind of future politics we want, All right? And then he goes on and uh, it just seems, it just, you know, to me, it's it's a it's a great way to think of the world as like it's all designed, it's all created. We we are living on this planet that we did not create, but everything else, everything, almost everything that defines our lives, is something that we are designing and that we can redesign. It's a it's a kind of a hopeful thought for people who are struggling with um, with the maddening reality of climate change and and like impending doom and extinctions and stuff and i i just want to say to to anyone who's who feels very uh despondent about that 
um, you're not alone. You know, we many of us feel that, and it's actually one of the reasons why I think people are in denial so much about climate change and would rather talk about you know, so many other things. I mean, not to mention there are so many other things going on, right? There's a, you know, there's a lot of things that are in the news cycle and things going on in our own personal lives that that take precedence. And so we kind of shunt the dirty air of the climate change reality that we're all starting to really feel physically and literally in our lives um, somewhere else, you know, and, um, and I think that that's a natural thing and it's a normal thing. It's a human thing. And it's, but it is, it is really great when you have a problem to face it. It's also really, really great and important if you expect to solve it. So, so I think that's one of the things that I would like to do with this talk is share some of, some of the ideas that I have about facing these, these issues that are so larger than life. Like actually um, Timothy Morton uh, has this concept of a hyper object. A hyper object is something that is, so big that there's no way for us to even grasp its totality. There's only a way for us to grasp our little end of it. Like the internet is a hyper object, you know, climate change is a hyper object. Um, anyway, let me start at the beginning. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you everyone. And I am uh, an Ecuadorian American um, visual artist, multimedia artist, uh, DJ. Um, I would say also a global citizen and educator. And I have some examples. I'm going to share my screen because I have examples of all of those things that I just said. Let's see. So I'd like to start with, um, let's see, am I here? Can I see? Can you see my screen here? Yes, I can see your screen. And I do see uh, some artwork, so yes. Okay, great. So this is just my website. It's lightbolt.net. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you is on there. So if you'd like to take a closer look, because I'm going to go fast, because I'd like to get to a QA. and a um, But um, so the first thing I said was, uh, I'm a global citizen, right? So one of the ways that that manifests is through projects like this, the Globo. This is uh, an international currency that I made that in 2008, when the economy collapsed, and there are printed bills. They're also a gallery installation. So they, this is a money case full of globos right there. You can see, and um, they stand between two prints of globos. And it's also like this uh, performance and intervention into the real economy because I'm exchanging globos with people. And if the gallery sells globos, they're, they're, they're um, exchanging globos too. And then now I'm actually turning that into a cryptocurrency, which is, if you're interested in that kind of thing, it's the, the globo.org. Uh, which is the latest iteration of my original Globo. So this is like an idea of, of, um, of a global economy, which is, which is the, actually what we have, but we just have divided it up in such a way that it's extremely unequal, right? Um, I mean, even within the wealthy countries, we have extreme inequality, which is kind of crazy because you would think that the rich countries would have rich life and the poor countries would not, but the rich countries have the exact same difference of uh, a huge inequality as the poor countries. Um, so the global was kind of like a theoretical way of, of having like a minimum wage, like a global minimum wage, making sure that people get paid no matter where they are or whatever. And the, the cryptocurrency will eventually function in that way as a, a global means of exchange that where we can earn money from our knowledge and experience. Basically, it's like a Wikipedia that you put stuff on, but you get you get paid for it. Um, so that's an example of how I'm a global citizen. Uh, and and uh, there are others, like, I also feel like, you know, travel is really important if you can swing it. Uh, I wish that it was easier. I wish that it was cheaper. I wish it was part of a, a mandatory part of everyone's education and not uh, like an exchange program for privileged people who, who can swing that. Because I do feel like that's an important part of, uh, of uh, becoming global citizens, which is what we all really need to do if we're going to solve this problem. We have to stop thinking about our little corners and really about the planet. Like that idea that Timothy Morton talks about shunting dirty air somewhere else. There is no nowhere else. I mean, there is no somewhere else. Okay, so as an educator, um, I hope you all know who Greta Thunberg is, um, a Swedish activist. She's got, a TED, she's got TED Talks. She's got a million videos. And she started the Fridays for Future movement where she um, cut school and and protests in front of Swedish parliament. And now it's a global movement of youth. And um, so I wanted to show you this, which is hot off of the press. 
This is work that my sixth graders today, because I am an educator from, I, I teach 11 to 18 year olds um, as in an art class. And so they turned a quote of hers into work. So th this is one class of like 10 kids and each kid made uh, one part of the quote. And, uh, and I, they love this and they love Greta and they love to pronounce her name correctly, which is Grieta Tumberi. And they do it perfectly because they're sixth graders. So the quote goes like this. We are now at a time in history where everyone with any insight of the climate crisis that threatens our civilization. Oh, this is out of order. It's supposed to be this one. And the entire biosphere that, that threatens our civilization and the entire bios biosphere must speak out in clear language no matter how uncomfortable and unprofitable that may be. And so this is literally uh, finished this morning and I'll put it up somewhere in the school. And, um, and it's just amazing to me, you know, the reason that we even did this project was because when I first met these kids, uh, these are 11, 12 year olds, I asked them, what was on their minds in terms of the world's future. I asked them about their personal futures and all these questions. And one of them was, "What's what are you concerned about in the world's future? And a lot of them mentioned climate change and these are kids. So they're, they're already thinking about this and aware of this. And some of the kids who finished before others, they were making their own artwork kind of in this vein and inspired by this idea. And so here's some of them, that's caution tape. So that's an example of <clears throat> my uh, climate work as an educator. As a, as a DJ, I would like to show you, um, let's see, this thing, this is Spotify. If you're on Spotify, I have a, I'm a light bulb and um, I could, I just made a playlist uh, for this show, um, this, which is, uh, as you probably know, at Lehman College and Wave Hill, I made the Eco Urgency Mix. And it's, um, it's about 14 hours at this point. <clears throat> you can just shuffle it, but it has a lot of music that is directly facing climate change or music that is not necessarily directly facing climate change, but it lends itself to that interpretation in whatever way. And yeah, uh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, Nikki is also in the show here at Lehman College, the Echo Urgency show. I'll and, show them. Uh, yeah, great. I just wanted to make sure I, I mentioned that. Yeah, and this is, you know, because I'm I am a world music DJ, so it's a very global mix. There's a lot of languages on here and <clears throat> a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. And you can see just from the titles, the tide is high. <laughs> not not you know the original versions, but uh, the you know the that there's a lot here that you can enjoy and that you have enjoyed. You might know some of these. That is um, at the same time eco urgency related and uh, and i find that it is cathartic to listen to some a mix like this just like it can be cathartic to read a book like this or whatever because then you're facing you're facing what is so hard to face and the reality that faces us all so that's as a dj now as an artist here's the 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 piece that i made at wave hill this is in the entrance in the vestibule and the, on the architecture there on both sides. So this is the picture of one side. On the other side, you have that too. Um, this is the same uh, piece that I created for uh, Lehman College. Here's Lehman's gallery. And that's up until April 23rd. So if you're Lehman students, you should definitely <clears throat> uh, check out the gallery show. And I have some pictures here to show you of what on earth. So this is the atrium of the of the Lehman College Gallery, which is an amazing space. I was really uh, honored to, to give, be given this space as a canvas for this show. Um, it's a famous architect that made this. Uh, what's his name? Marcel Breuer. Marcel yeah, Breuer, he's the, right, yeah. the famous uh, Bauhaus architect. So, you know, this is, it's amazing. It's almost like I'm collaborating with this famous, amazing architect. And so the piece, is a text-based piece, but it's it's also a sound piece, and it's um, it's also uh, 
visual, it's like the, the way visual uh, changes the sound. So I'll, I'll read it for you. What on earth have you done? 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 And what on earth have you done? So obviously a lot of different uh, interpretations of, um, are available to the reader. And it, it's uh, ultimately just like a DJ works. <clears throat> I take something existing, pre-existing from the culture, in this case, an idiomatic expression that you've heard a million times in English. You may have used it a million times, but not necessarily listened to it and thought that earth was at the center of it and that this could apply to our predicament, our human predicament right now. What are we doing to this earth? You know, So that's, a, and then this picture is a, it's a great one, but it doesn't show the scale. So I wanted to show you just how big this place is, this thing is and so here's one with me in front of it and even this one doesn't show the scale so i have a process shot of me painting that shows the scale that's how big this piece is so it is really yelling off of that wall you know i have um, a quick question you yeah. showed the one you have a, an example of it uh at wave hill and it's yeah. in the little vestibule areas it's sort of wrapping and distorting within it yeah, uh, like, yeah, in those little inset areas. Did you do that by hand? Like, how did you account for the distortion? Yeah. Well, I used a, a, a little mini projector that I put on a tripod with a swivel. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Control. And so yeah. that's how I did both of them, actually. You know, I was playing okay. around with the projector, projecting it how I wanted it. And this one was definitely a, a challenge for that, but I, yeah. I really liked it, too. It, it, it just warps it. It just warps yeah. the, the thoughts. And so, yeah, that's how I did that. And then, and then once I had it projected, I did it all by hand um, uh, with, with uh, I had an assistant for this one, which is a friend of mine, Laure Cuvillier. She's a French artist. And then uh, at uh, Lehman College, I, I had an assistant, Paul Murray, who's a, my neighbor and also a, a young artist. Um, couldn't have done it without them. And actually Lehman College's um, gallery staff also helped out because it was so much to do. And it was, and it's very challenging. You know, it looks like, crisp and clear and easy, but it's challenging. Okay, then um, I wanted to show, this is the original piece of this is 2012. So it's 10 years old. And the original is vinyl on plexiglass and it's two by three feet. So it's a smallish, not so small, but smallish piece. And, and it's definitely not eco-friendly, which is interesting, right? In the 10 years, I would definitely not do this piece. Like for example, I could have done it at Lehman College or at Wave Hill with vinyl. But I wouldn't do that because it's an it's an eco show, and I want to try and just like we should be doing with our whole lives, try and be more sustainable, more aware of how we do things in a way that is not destroying the planet. And it's really hard to do that, you know. And you know, we we all fail at that, even if we're trying really hard. It's uh, it's not something that we can do alone we, because we live in this world that is not supportive of that. So, for example, even when I painted this on Lehman's wall. It's acrylic paint. I mean, the difference between vinyl and acrylic is really not that great. So it's like still, but there are, um, one of the artists in Lehman College in the show, uh, Vanessa Albury, just uh, recently sent me a link to some eco paints, which I will uh, share in the chat later, uh, because I'm, I'm curious about those things and you know how to, to really make a practice that's more sustainable. Here's a, this was an, uh, an exhibition at the Hunter East Harlem Gallery, which is uh, part of Hunter College. It's called uh, Census 2020. I did it two years ago and I just have some pictures. I'll just go quickly with these because there's a lot and it's an intense show. But, but, um, but one thing to know about it is that I made it on cardboard because it's the same idea of like the materials that I'm using. I, I'm trying to not necessarily do more, you know, I'm, I'm actually removing stuff from the recycling room to do this project. So this was like a protest project. Uh, I started with a real protest sign, which was a no justice, no peace during the George Floyd protests. And, um, and then that was also part of my thinking was I wanted to make a piece that looked like ink and paint on cardboard, like a protest sign, but the whole thing becomes a protest sign. So this was also time to coincide with the US census of 2020. And this is what it looks like on, on both walls. Uh, it's really big. It's a lot. And it's the idea is boxes. I was actually exploring, um, uh, um, I was mostly exploring the idea of racial uh, classification boxes and ethnic ethnicity on the census, which is a whole fascinating thing. There's a whole other talk, but 
But um, so here you can see that I, I basically fill out my census form. There you can see the scale. I basically fill out my census form in public on this piece. And I, you know, uh, I'll leave it there for you to ponder what is going on with these boxes. And then also how do they relate to other boxes, right? And so how do they relate to the ballot box or to the incarceration box or to the mailbox? You know, I even had a definition of boxes, rigid containers, um, uh, protest sign boxes. Um, this is when this is called uh, kettling when uh, when the police box you in at a protest solitary confinement box the the worst uh, box that comes from the race boxes is the coffin box which is what we were protesting against in at this time in 2020 even black lives matter is a box here's a climate box a quarantine box um, so I, I really went off I just went off the rails thinking of boxes zoom boxes everyone was on zoom at this time these are my friends. Shout out to my friends. <laughs> There's the climate box, uh, which is, I guess, a factory or like, you know, you could define it in many ways, but uh, there's uh, portraits of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, rest in peace. And I, I, this is from another talk where I wanted to say, I wanted to know justice and I wanted to know peace. So like no justice, no peace, I want to know. I wish, you know, that's my, my goal in life. So that's as an artist, this is another piece. I'll just quickly show a few more that you can look in um, online. This is a wall size huge. This woman is life size. It's called Plie Pacasse. That means this is from inspired from a Haitian song, which, and as you know, Haiti deals with climate change intensely for a long time already. And uh, it's from a song called, um, I forget the song, but I can, I can share it. Um, it's called Plie Pacasse means bend, don't break. Right, you know, if you've ever been aware of ballet, plié, it means bend. Um, yeah, it's French. It, yeah, right. It's blueprint for resistance. Yeah, and so the whole thing is built on blueprints, and uh, and then painted, and it's like the the idea of of being resilient, uh, you know, as a human being, just a human being in the in the awesome force of nature, um, especially when nature is angry, when we've made nature angry. Like, how do we? bend but not break and, and that's what we're already starting to do here's a piece called overturned here's a piece called rome was not burnt in a day <laughs> part of an uh, of a of a show of a piece that i made called inflammatory it was an in installation this is a piece called the ravages which is an, a sound piece there was music uh, emanating from that sculpture this is a piece called mirror ball which is uh which is Here's a picture of it in the exhibition, in an exhibition in, in Philadelphia. Um, it was uh, a disco ball. It's from, it's kind of like my DJing and my <laughs> art beat. And I just turned it into a globe and I put it on a motor so it spins and I put a light on the bottom. And so it kind of projects uh, the, the world onto its surroundings. And it also, it also makes you be reflected when you look at it, because it's pretty low hanging. It also reflects you in the world, wherever in the world, you know. So these are some examples of my my art, and um, and so that's basically all I wanted to share with you, which is a lot anyway. I threw a lot, and uh, please feel free to to look at my website further, and and I'm I'm open to any questions, and I have a few ideas that I'd like to share with you, but they'll probably yeah. come up with questions. So yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, Robert, did you have any questions you want to start, or did you? Yeah, want to... uh, well, first thing was I wanted to go back to your, you were talking about using these materials and you know the sort of dilemma with the using the the mylar and the the plexiglass and so on. And this is sort of like this reoccurring theme for for uh, all artists. <laughs> you know, as an yeah, animator, yeah. it's like you know tra tra going from starting out as an animator on paper and and, and uh, lacetate when you'd finish a film, you'd have a six foot high pile of this stuff. And now it's all digital and so on. So it's 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 cardened off the the footprint of that process to some degree, to some degree, not totally, because there's a whole lot of extenuating things that are contributing to that. But there's still the sort of thing of this: the artist is creating objects, and uh, and and uh, you know the sort of ritual nature of that process, and 
you know, you're sort of crossing over back and forth with the with the two things because you sort of got I, this very clear use of ideas that's it's it's not as it's not encoded as it's encoded, but in a much in a much more accessible way, uh, and it and it isn't um, reliant on this thing of having you know this 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 object which you you know you 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 put you work on you make it you put it and you have to then you have to deal with it you have to either put it in a museum put it in storage or whatever and there's this like huge like industry of these objects being created all the time and 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 it's it just at this point in history you can't help but it's not it's no longer like a, a so much as a i mean it still is a lens of looking kind of looking at how it was just to see the world through but it's also now become a sort of manifestation of part of this this uh it, this this kind of dilemma of of the, all this stuff since we've now reached the point where right. we know there's more man-made the weight of the man-made stuff in the world it now exceeds the weight of nature this is a this is a, a thing we've crossed over last year wow. i think it was last year uh so so this sort of throws a whole other lens on the artist's problem yeah um well i think i mean i have thoughts about that a lot because because first of all the, this is kind of like the, what I was saying about the DJ who appropriates pre-existing material, right, to create things. The remix, for example. Right. And right. I feel like that's that's definitely a postmodern vein of uh, strategy that that artists is, are using in a huge way. Like for for a long time, artists have been like, I'm not necessarily trying to create something new. I'm trying to kind of remix materials, you know, even if it's like a collage. Or whatever, and uh, and so that's that's one really interesting thing is um, what do we really need to be making new things in this world, or do we be, really need to be creative about what we've got and how we use it, you know? And then even like for the digital thing, like for example, um, my cryptocurrency is definitely not going to be uh, an energy suck like Bitcoin, but it still will be powered by individual users at a computer, just like an animation studio and. And so the question at that point becomes, so where's the electricity come, coming from, yeah. right? How green right. is that grid? You can drill it. This, yeah, yeah right. that's a question. It's a question that just popped up is, uh, and this, this happened a couple of times in the Q&A, that how do you reconcile the fact that mining crypto creates cryptocurrency and NFTs, et cetera, creates a large amount of CO2 through its massive energy draw while maintaining an environment, um, environmentalist stance? Yeah, well, it's a good question, but I think most people don't realize that it's not necessarily all cryptocurrencies that are that are um, going to be that um, energy intensive. Bitcoin yeah. is very energy intensive and therefore has given a bad rap to it all. And yeah. it's not like yeah. that. And so, and it also, <clears throat> you know, the bottom line is that uh, if you can, you know, I, I'm not going to speak to Bitcoin because I don't have anything to do with Bitcoin, but but the bottom line is that if we can trans uh to transform our energy uh, consumption to be to be renewable yeah 100 uh, yeah. percent then that question of how come you're using so much energy <clears throat> it's kind of like becomes a, a moot point because right right because that's the issue and in, in in a twisted way i feel like bitcoin even though it is obviously taking way too much energy and it is uh polluting um i feel like that whole discussion about that and that pressure on the cryptocurrency industry actually could have a positive effect where people are like, look, we really need to, to uh, stop with the fossil fuels. I mean, we really do. And like the war in Ukraine is, is even more like right now, gasoline is, is so expensive. And, and it's like, how many signs do you need yeah. to actually say, okay, no more fossil yeah. fuels, you know, like we really need to do that. And so, yeah. Yeah, that's that's how to me it's like um, you know I'm, I reconcile that by by knowing that the cryptocurrency that I'm uh, developing is going to not take any more energy than you at your computer, and so which at this point is still problematic because it's fossil fuels. But we need to change that, and this is this is not something that any of us can change as individuals, but that we we all kind of, I mean that was one of the the thoughts that I had. Um, that I wanted to share is that one of the maddening things about dealing with climate change, about facing climate change is that, is that we're caught in the middle in a way. We're not, it's very, it's almost impossible to live such a small life that you're not contributing to the problem, right? But yet, you know, you, you do feel like 
how do you make a difference in the problem? How do you help solve the problem? Right? So it's like, it's like you have the worst of, we all have the worst of both worlds. We're too small to change the problem, to fix the problem, but we're big enough to contribute to it, you know? And this is a dilemma. And, uh, you know, there, we can't, there's no way that any of us are going to be able to solve this dilemma. What we can do is help to, in from our little corner to help solve this dilemma, right? Yeah, our this is the hyper object. This mm -hmm. keeps coming up too, like this idea, this tension between um, private or individual responsibility yeah. versus the responsibility of the state. And in this country, I think what people don't, I mean, we've sort of been dulled to the fact that the, our state, the US government, our state governments, our local governments don't really have a lot of responsibility for us, honestly. In, in if you really look around it, globally speaking, are they're pretty hands off. Like most people, you know, are on their own here. It's right? the land of the individual. Yeah, exactly. And and that's just that is demonstrably true. So uh and so it's no surprise, right, that we're fed this narrative that you have to do your part as an individual, as a person, as an American, as a citizen, uh, and not to not use to recycle, to not use plastic drinking straws, to drive less, to carpool all true i'm not going to argue with those things like be the change you want to see in the world right but um the things that really move and change in this country uh happen because of government intervention for example some of the biggest polluters in the world are corporations those are those are legal instruments right a corporation is a group of people right but they're formed through legal instrumentation their ability to force policy changes to force tax loopholes is all protected by our government and other governments around the world. So, uh, and and many corporations, like for example Walmart, which has an a, an internal uh, economy that's greater than some than most nations. I think it's like a seventh on the list of the amount of money that transfers through it, and it beats out most nations. They they don't pay their their uh, employees a living wage, right? So, and and actually, this is this famous story that. I think this is about 15 years ago or so now, but in their employee handbook, they used to, um, and they may still do this. I don't work for, I don't work for Walmart. I don't know. They would urge their employees to go on welfare to supplement their income. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not making enough money, go on welfare. That can, mm -hmm. like your ways that you can do it through government assistance, mm -hmm. which is essentially asking us as taxpayers to, to, to basically subsidize their workforce, right. which well, is we've so. we've been doing it. I mean, it's not we've been asking. doing it. Yeah. We've been doing it. Yeah, we've been doing it. And my, I guess my point around this is when and how much do we push this idea of the individual in our work as artists, as, as, uh, mm -hmm. as political activists, who, whatever, as messengers, whatever we are, um, versus this idea that it's really up to our policymakers. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, I mean, that it's not, it doesn't surprise me that that keeps coming up. Um, and right. it's, it is global too. Like, uh, for example, uh, Kate Simpson, who is the editor of this book, which I also highly recommend, is called I, Out of Time, Poetry from the Climate Emergency. Um, she, she, there's also an interview with her where she says, she says, this is, she's in, in the UK. So she says, yeah. we are urged to buy less single use plastic in a system which continues to produce and promote right. single use plastic. Exactly right. what I'm talking about. Oh, exactly. It's like, it's like so. So what? I'm supposed to feel guilty when I buy a Snapple, even though Snapple keeps on pushing Snapple into every my every walking, yeah. you know. And so, okay. So then, so obviously, there's a way that that there's like a shunting of mm -hmm. responsibility onto the individual. It's much easier yeah. for a government and a and a corporation to say, well, why don't you just act better and leave right. us leave us out of it yeah but i do feel like there is you know there there is a responsibility on the individual not so much for these things of like don't buy snapple make right. your own tea and put it in in one of these bottles although that would be nice but statistically meaningless but but like the real thing that that an individual can do is to um well there are many things that an individual can do but one of them is to precisely to apply pressure to governments yeah. and corporations and and, and, and vote <laughs> And that also, well, that's that's the main way, but the that also means nothing statistically if you're the only one doing it, right? So right. it's really about yes. a, kind of a 
massive awareness of like we need to act as as not as individuals but as a community you know collective yeah. action yeah. and that is where artists come in i feel like uh you know yeah. we're, we're here to raise awareness to to put this problem in your face to to make you wonder about these things to make you feel outraged to make you feel grief to make you yeah. feel fear all of these things that you don't want to feel right that but that we need to feel and that ultimately are cathartic to feel right i do feel yeah. like one of the roles that an artist has in this time and she talks a lot about this in this uh in this book and uh is um is really to to kind of mirror or just just to help people work through these feelings that are really dark about the the situation that we're in because nobody wants to really go there. It's very hard, you know, to, to have a discussion about this in, in polite company. So one way to do it is kind of like through art, through poetry, through reading, through that kind of community, you know? But- um, Yeah, I, I, not to interrupt you, but I think that's dead on. I mean, it is, and in some ways, I think we identified this early on that it's sort of become the role of the artist to activate other people, not through, you know, leafleting or or necessarily or or protesting and and the traditional sort of social actions, but just through art, right? Art art should be dangerous and scary and and always be slapping us across the face metaphorically. Um, well, it's just so. like you, yeah. You, I mean, oh. you said it yourself. We we live in a system we designed, right? Mm -hmm. And and we have designed, and on top of all these other systems, we designed a system where we don't talk about things that make us uncomfortable, right? We don't talk about Bruno, right? We, don't, we just don't, we don't go there, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's something that artists have a role to, to yeah. dismantle. They have to undesign that system. Let's put it, let's put it that yeah. way, is what you're saying, right? Okay. Yeah, well, artists do talk about Bruno and that's definitely one of the- <laughs> Artists talk about Bruno, right? Yeah, but, uh, but I also feel like it's not either or, you know? And I don't ultimately feel like, um, like it's that different. For, for right. artists and for anyone. Like you do what you can in your own way, right? Artists happen to have uh, the means to communicate visually in, in a large way, like in the center of a Lehman College gallery. And so I'm gonna do it that way. But everyone has their own way that they could like make raise awareness or whatever. And I can, just because I'm an artist doing that doesn't mean that I can't show up to a Fridays for Future and demand that my elected representatives actually represent me and my concern for the yeah. future of my children and grandchildren, right? And so everyone can do that. And if everyone did that, we'd be living in a different world. So to me, that raising awareness and activation is really key. And I, actually, she speaks about that a little bit here. Let me see. She yeah. speaks about it beautifully. This this Kate Simpson is just incredible. yeah. I put a link in it, a link for that in the chat, by the way, Great. everybody. So if you're interested Thank in, you. yeah, like she says, uh, let's see, there were a couple of things. Oh, I wanted to read some of her titles, and then uh, here she says, um, okay, so this anthology. She's talking about poetry, but you know, you can just substitute art for poetry, and it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. This mm -hmm. anthology cannot be a solution or global source of awakening, no more than it can be truly representative of all the issues at hand, featuring voices from all languages, cultures, and contexts. But it can do something. There's a huge role to be played in writing that alters the narrative, and in turn, our perspective of this critical moment. And when scientific facts are no longer accepted or understood quickly enough, we must turn to other modes of communication that reach us on an innate and universal level. That's where we come in, yeah. you know? And like, who's gonna be like, oh my God, we need to go protest because I just read the, you know, this <laughs> scientific uh, data, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, this is, this has to be, we are working with scientists, right? And this is why it's beautiful to be talking to this group right here, because it's yeah. artists and scientists. And we, we need to work together so, so that we can be like, okay, people, this is not a joke. This is not a drill. We need to do something if we actually care about our children, which I know we do you know yeah so like yeah it's it's almost like a mass delusion that we're in and like you said we need to yeah snap out of it although although so, somebody in the chat reminded me that it's perhaps too soon to make jokes about slapping which is that's my fault <laughs> too soon, too that's, soon. yeah too soon so wait, um, let me read you some of this the, the titles of these poems like just just the titles new planet who this <laughs> void Confluence, the trees, 
the science of life, oil music, waiting, God complex, giant sequoia, silence slash presence, hashtag extinction rebellion, which is a, a, one of the important uh, um, activist organizations out there. Yeah. Um, tuna, uh, plant life, becoming moss, um, geography lesson. These are just some of the, the titles. And then, and then this is another interesting thing is that like, you know, the reason you invited me to this talk is because I'm making climate change kind of like eco artwork in an, in the context of an eco artwork show. Right. Right. So she calls that whole thing into question. And she, and she says, again, substituting poetry with art, uh, will there be a point in which eco writing is no longer recognized as a literary subgenre or category, but rather an assumed genre and context attributed to all writing, regardless of its subject or form? Will this anthology in inevitably be dated by its self-professed presentation of eco poems, mm. poems that actively respond to a climate emergency in progress? Right, and yeah. that brings us right back to this idea that all art is ecological, which is, which is really to say that everything is ecological. We're living in ecological reality. We just need to snap out of the delusion that would suggest otherwise. That's exactly what we talked about the very first lecture of this series. We talked with James Mann, who's a he's a uh, philosopher. And we talked about where does this idea that we're somehow separate from our ecology, from our environment come from? And it, 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 in the West, it comes from the birth of rationalist thought and the scientific revolution, et cetera. And then eventually philosophically from Rene Descartes, mm -hmm. right? And part of our role is as artists, as scientists, as people trying to fight this fight is to reposition human beings within this, the, the, the Venn diagram of, of the environment, right? We are part and parcel of the environment. We have been made from the environment. We are uh, determining where the, the environment goes in very large parts, increasingly more so. Uh, and part of our role is just positioning the person. I mean, artists are great at doing this, right? Uh, yeah, they're great at positioning people in certain places, repositioning even. Yeah, it's also, it's also a kind of a problem of getting people to sort of, you know, what you're calling slapping is like, I was discussing with one of our students today was uh, sort of changing their fixed assemblage point of reason. People have, you know, yeah. our whole social construct is, is, is predicated on certain kind of formal ways of viewing the world and, yes. you know, which are, are in themselves limiting. They kind of, right. you know, they sort of say, this is how it has to be. So we can't even look over here because yep. not, if it does exist, we don't really want to know, which means you've ruled out a whole, a whole set of possibilities. Yeah. And, you know, when, one of the things, you know, uh, about music, for example, or um, uh, performance is, you know, it's this thing which exists only when it's happening and there's nothing, there's no residuals. There's no, I mean, this is the beautiful thing about music, I guess. It's like you've conjured this whole, this whole thing and, and then it's, it's gone. As fast as it's coming out, it's gone. It's sort of like this conversation, except this conversation is recorded. And, uh, you know, the magic will be gone. The magic will be gone, right. Well, hopefully we can sustain the magic a little bit. But, uh, but the, the, so, so you have this issue, which is, you know, you want to have this kind of reach this, this kind of place of understanding, uh, which is fugitive on the one hand, on the other hand, it's not, it's, 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 I, I, I kind of think it goes back to some, uh, uh, sort of almost ritual thing, which, and this relates to poetry, I think too, uh, but this, this, this of just being, just stopping and being, and accepting being bored or accepting, uh, just be, being, uh, you know, in, in one place. And what is the sort of the range of things that are happening in one place? This goes back to, I think the second lecture, was it that James did, Lendemer? Uh, was third, third, yeah, third, third, like, third, yeah. Uh, who was a lichen and, and, and mycelium specialist from the Bronx Botanical. And, you know, the, re, the, the, you know, one of the interesting things about the whole uh, fungal network is, you know how it, it it it's constantly in in this state of dynamics you change and if something is affected in one place it starts to it, it affects the way the other part of it works and then maybe that's feeding the situation that's maybe uh, suffering from something and maybe you're taking it and absorbing it and putting it somewhere else and it's this con continual state of sort of reinvention and that's just doing it on the fly all the time mm -hmm. and uh 
you know, we kind of somehow have an idea we don't, we, we're incapable of doing that. And I think it's such a big idea. It's so, it's like, okay, it's about consumption. It's about production. It's about all these things that we sort of built into how we live that I don't know if, you know, it's like, it's almost too much. It's too much for most people to kind of, wrap, it's too much for anybody to wrap their head around, really. Yeah. So where, do you, where do you start? So where do you start? You know, that's the big, that's the big thing. And, and, yeah. you know, like the events of the last, excuse me? Maybe you stop, like you were saying, you know? Yeah, exactly. Stopping is stopping. Like we stopped for COVID. I mean, that was I not lost on, on eco people that we stopped for COVID. We learned a lot yeah. from that process. We were just discussing this. This is like yeah. a process that that's right. jostled the, the minds of a lot of people. I mean, some people, they did shut down. They, the window closed and closed. But, you know, for some people, it kind of opened up other other opportunities in their more immediate surroundings, which they didn't even know existed. They weren't looking for them. They didn't see them. They didn't. So we're sort of, I think that's going to be a, that's a big part of the transition we're going through because everybody's sort of a freaked out. They're kind of going, well, you know, uh, you know, you're, if you're a certain kind of a farmer now, you're, you're dealing with a shift in agriculture that is so outside the boundaries of everything you were you taught when you were going to agricultural school and you know it's just the whole thing has got to be like just turned yeah yeah and that's a scary prospect for people who whose livelihoods rely on that and that's kind of true of, for everyone basically yeah, i mean yeah for every everybody you know, yeah there isn't you know, anything that isn't affected by it what is it uh um cage uh, there's a cage quote that says i don't know why why these new ideas scare so many people? It's the old ideas that scare me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, that's it's funny. Cool. It's it's funny that we started talking about music because as a DJ, you you know how important it is to like read the room and the vibe, right, of the crowd. How, can you talk about how that's in some ways similar to being an artist? And is it like being? Yeah, well, I think that it's it's not exactly you know people always like this idea that the DJ is reading the crowd, but it's really it's much more complicated than that. That's a part of it, but there's also a part of it where it's like leading the crowd in a sonic yeah. sonic journey, and and there has to be a balance. If you're really just reading the crowd, then you're really just such a crappy DJ because basically you're just <laughs> making requests. You're taking requests. Every, yeah, and you have nothing to offer. You're basically just a mechanical like transition maker of the cra of yeah. the crowd. But a, yeah. a good DJ is like. I mean, I kind of have a sense of where where the sonic room is, and I want to take them on a, a magical journey with. That. Yeah, yeah, and that's so interesting, that's, right? But it has to still be. It can't be so magical and so out of bounds that that this that I lose this people. That people don't even want to go on this journey anymore. So it's like, and that's how it is with art too. Like, yeah, you could. I mean, nobody wants to see certain. I mean, there. I mean, there's all kinds of art. So there is art that's like about the abject, where most people would not even want to look at it because it's mm -hmm. abject, right? But uh, but in general, it's like, yeah, it's like this thing of like, I'm sh giving you something that you can, that you're, that attracts you, that you, that you enjoy aesthetically. And yet I'm also leading you someplace where maybe you didn't even know you were going. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting point. Um, the other thing that I think I find interesting about DJing is that it's basically collage. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's essentially take, yeah, it's a sonic collage. Right. And it, and it, you know, it, one of the things we've been talking about in this class is sound design and, and, and we were, you know, we've been right now we're at the stage where um, we're, we're game to get sound from anywhere, right. Natural sound, but in the city, in the Bronx, that could mean a hundred different things, right. It, uh, a subway is a natural sound. I hear natural sound coming from the room next to me right now. I don't know what it is. It's like some loud sound, uh, but it's it's animal life, right? I think that's where people gravitate towards. But it's also cars and automobiles and and construction, uh, wind. Uh, yeah, weather, it, it, talk plane, about that and about yeah, pl the countless planes that go by. Talk about it, it you know, as a sound designer it, in a way. Um, could you talk to us about how we might want to think about sound in, in this context of what we're doing as an installation piece. Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, there's, my, in terms of like my advice, I would say uh, one of the reasons that I love uh, DJing is because, precisely because it involves uh, a listener, right? It's not simply, 
like a sonic experiment that I'm doing in my studio or that maybe winds up in a gallery or something like that. It's really, there's a public, there's like, it's almost, it's, it's like a socially engaged artwork, right? And so that's my main advice I would say for your installation is to, to think about the listener, the, right? The listener, not, so it's, it's like, let go a little bit of what you would want to do. Definitely don't let go of it all completely, but also like think about like, what, how do you rope a listener in? Right. What is the sound that you need to rope them in? And also just the environment, because, you know, sound is a, one of the classic ways of meditation. Right. Block out everything, empty your mind and just listen. Right. Listen to the sounds. Focus on what are you hearing and like identify like, you know, that's one of my favorite ways of meditating. I do it on my bike. I'm just like I forget about where I'm going, what I'm doing. I'm just thinking of what I hear. I heard a plane. I heard a squirrel. I heard a car going by. I hear a siren way off. I hear the whatever you hear. And so something like that, that's very interesting. Ideally, I would suggest that you make a surround sound installation, 5.1, five speakers and a subwoofer, and you put them around in, in wherever you're putting this, I think in the gallery, right? Um, and then uh, and make something that is just like kind of kind of ropes you in, kind of cool, feels good, but then also has like these surprising things that happen that you were definitely not expecting and and that are but they're still interesting and cool like you don't want to be jarring you know sound is can drive people right out of the room you know <laughs> volume that's actually my my number one advice for you it's volume it sounds yeah. simple sounds like nothing sounds like a knob well, well actually, if you actually if you worked in the, if you, you you were we showed us pictures of you painting in the gallery so you must know our, our gallery director bart yeah. Um, so, so Bart, Bart Bland has, I, I, we haven't, I, I haven't spoken in this and he's probably watching or is going to watch this, hi, but Bart. hi Bart. I know that Bart has very specific concerns about sound because of course, um, yeah, well, he has to levels. Get, yeah. The levels and volume is key. So we're going to have yeah. to work under these, uh, under constraints. Um, right. but we are thinking about it and this, uh, this idea that you, you sort of tease or rope in people with sound. And then yeah. kind of, every so often you sort of jolt them. Yeah. I think it's definitely on point. Yeah. Uh, and it's also definitely volume, on point. You know, you have to, when you jolt, it's more like a conceptual jolt. You don't want to jolt with volume because that's no. just annoying. And no, so with volume, concept, yeah. If you're collaging different sounds together, which it sounds like you're doing, then you're going to want to, uh, to pay very close attention to those transitions and fade ins and fade outs because that's yeah. really where it's at. That's why it's so important that a DJ has the ability to fade things out and in and like the transition. Transitions are key to the collage, right? Yeah, it's, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, this, I, I've noticed that that you, you sometimes a good DJ you stumble into the next piece of music. You don't even know that you're there, and all of a sudden you're there, and there's some thread. It, it, there's some thread that's been that they found. It's like they've thrown a line out and then it hooks into the other piece and then you can right. get connected through that. It's sometimes, really wonderful sometimes. Experience. other times it's a jarring thing. Yeah, like, it's like a quick chuka slap. Chuka bam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but chuka chuka bam has to definitely also keep in mind the volume. The volume yeah. because if it's chuka chuka bam, it's like <laughs> yeah. That, you know? that, that's what the level meters are for on the on the mixer. Exactly. I learned that. I, I learned that the hard way. Um, what. <laughs> One other question, just to we 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 should probably finish. But uh, you were talking about the globo as as a digital currency uh, mm -hmm. and a global one, and mm -hmm. it kind of me it kind of made me think like such a thing right now. I don't know if it's possible. I mean, we're looking right now at this in this news with the war in Ukraine and um, how economics is being used as a form of warfare. Really, the first form mm -hmm. of warfare and it's sanctions based. But it's also currency based, and apparently, this, uh, Russia had a lot of their currency stored as euros and American dollars in foreign banks, and that's what part of the sanctions are for to limit. They can't use those now, so they're asking for gas payments uh, in rubles, the Russian currency, and Germany is balking at that. The European Union saying no, we're not going to do that. So there's this tension going on between currencies, mm -hmm. and it seems like yeah, global currency could solve all of this, but um, that would require a global bank not the world bank because it's not really a global bank that's a sort of mm -hmm. colonizing mm -hmm. dream you know to mm -hmm. to do such a thing but how do you see something like that realistically happening where there is a kind of global currency mm -hmm. and that it doesn't fall prey to the same inequities and the same kind of extract extraction 
that uh, capitalism has sort of caused everywhere in the world, no matter what currency is in. Yeah, well, this is something I've obviously been thinking a lot about. And uh, I mean, um, I have a lot of thoughts about it. So uh, first of all, I would say that it's not like you would necessarily ever need to have some kind of centralized bank, right? In mm -hmm. my opinion, the, what, what, what we say in our white paper for the Globo is that the world is moving towards a tokenized economy, which is almost the exact opposite of a, glo of a, of a, of a centralized yeah, bank. Right. It's like there's, there are a bunch of currencies that are coexisting. We're used to, just because of habit, just because we've designed it that way, we're used to having like one currency in this country and then one in that one. But yeah. we're obviously already out of that, even though most people may have not noticed yet, but we're out of that. And there are already global currencies, uh, largely cryptocurrencies that you can use in different countries at the same time. That's true, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's, that's one of the ways that it's going and that, that I, I don't think, I think the cat's out of the bag. Like there's nothing gonna stop this, our world economy from becoming tokenized and ha people having. And so the beauty of that, the, the potential of that, the revolutionary potential of that, which is what interests me is, is the fact that we don't have to necessarily rely on this superstructure that is the mint that is creating the dollars and that it says how much they're worth and that says how you get them, right? You don't necessarily have to be like working for the man to get your dollar. You can actually be creating your whatever token in alternative ways, in interesting yeah. ways, right? Like maybe with things that, that you don't even think of as valuable uh, normally, wow. right? that are valuable. Like for yeah. example, um, like I'm I'm going to Germany this summer for a fellowship of uh, it's called Drawing for German, where I'll be learning German by drawing people, and then they get the drawing, and so that's like a currency exchange in a sense. But their currency, my currency, is a portrait drawing art, not so weird the idea of selling art, but the idea that your conversational German skills could be like some kind of earn you something in in a cafe like without without you being like a language teacher. That's kind of uh, that's kind of where cryptocurrency is thinking. Like, what what do you have to offer that is normally not? No one wants to pay for it, and here we are, where we can be exchanging all sorts of tokens for all sorts of things, and not necessarily rely on the yeah world or the. It's just the, not a codified blockchain. It's just a blockchain in action. It's just yeah. You know, it's like bartering in a way. You know, you do something for yeah. one person and you give it's, it's, yeah. It's yeah. interesting. You make the point too that it's a dis it's distributed by its very nature. So the whole idea of a central bank or a world bank is kind of besides the point. Exactly. You know, That's why it's yeah. called DeFi. They call it, you know, the it's decentralized finance. Is, yeah, is, is where where everyone's um, thinking about, it. and that that's actually it has potential to be revolutionary, which is precisely why all you hear about it is, oh my God, this is terrible for the environment. And right. this is really good for money laundering and drug dealing and child pornography because because like it's definitely a threat to the prevailing yeah. order we're living in right now. And that's what should be interesting to you, you know? What right, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, okay, that's unfortunately, I feel like we could go on for another hour just about cryptocurrency and NFTs. I want to have a whole series about on. NFTs. Yeah, I'm making uh, one, but let me just yeah. take my notes because I wanted to say... I wanted to make sure I said certain things. Okay, the only thing I'm, yeah. I would like to close out on is that that you, we feel like we can't do anything, but but really I want to say to Lehman students and, and whoever else is here, thank you for being here, that really we can do many things. We can raise awareness. We can sound the alarm. We can apply political pressure through infinite forms of activism. Mm -hmm. We can bear witness, which is actually the title of a show that I'll be in uh, this summer. Uh, we can make space for climate grief morning speak truth face reality no matter how tragic we have to remain hopeful we can do something as kate simpson says you know wow great so thank, thank you, you so much. thank you yeah. nikki uh for being here thank you robert for for also being here uh next week just before we go i just want to mention there is no talk next week um our next lecture and our final lecture in the series is going to be on friday april 29th so all the way in the other side of the month at 1 p.m we're gonna be talking to Hadrian Kumans and Joe Baker from Lenape Center, which is based in Staten Island, but they represent the Lenape Nation, uh, which used to live here before colonists came. Uh, here by me in New York City and Jersey and all kinds of areas around this area. Uh, so please join us for that, our final talk. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Nikki, again. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we'll Thank see you. you guys in roughly a month. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Have a great weekend. All right, you too. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.